I'm so excited that we have um, Jesse Morgan Owens as our keynote today. Jesse, um, uh, we always start, kick this off with a keynote, and we try to look for keynotes who are new in the Netherlands. Um, and as you know, this is a good opportunity to sort of meet some new faces in the Netherlands. Um, so new North American Studies scholars uh, in the Netherlands. So Jesse is not new to North American Studies by any stretch of the imagination, but she is definitely new to us here in the Netherlands, and we are so happy that I accidentally screwed up her PowerPoint, uh, but let me just uh, uh, let me just uh, introduce her properly. Jesse, um, sitting down here at the front, is a uh, university lecturer uh, of American literature and American studies at Leiden University. She is our uh, newest uh, edition and our coolest edition. Oh, Dario, actually, you're our newest edition, but she's our coolest. Oh, um, uh, she's uh, this is a position that she only just started this uh, this academic year in the fall of 2021. She is a native of Louisiana and not ashamed to admit it. Uh, indeed, she's from the, from the Delta region and not ashamed to admit it. Um, Jessie was uh, formerly Dean of Studies at Bard College in New Orleans. Uh, she's also the author of the book Girl in Black and White, the story of Mary Mil Mildred Williams and the Abolition Movement, which was published in 2019 with uh, Norton and was a finalist for, finalist for the prestigious Lincoln Prize. Um, and introduces, uh, this, this book introduces an unknown poster child whose photograph transforms the abolition movement. Uh, Jesse is a special, specialist, as you will learn today, in uh, studying photography and history and sort of the intersection between uh, how images uh, affect uh, 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 social discourse about, uh, about uh, racial injustice, among other things. So we are so grateful to kick this off with uh, a lecture by Jesse, which I'm sure will be fruitful and stimulating, uh, with a talk titled Free Renty, uh, Tamara Lanier versus Harvard uh, and the Future of the Photographic Archive. Let's welcome Jesse to the floor. Thanks again, Jesse, for being here for us. Um, hi. For those of you who don't know me, um, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Damien and Albertina, and for NASA for hosting me in this um, debutante moment of me getting the chance to meet the uh, North American Studies Association of my new home. Um, so thank you so much for having me and for your generosity in having us all here today. This is a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I have a lot of students here today. And so as uh, those of you who have worked with me before know I force you to make a, um, a, a, a statement of your methodology and the cultural objects that are interesting to you. So I'm gonna do that first. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and, and be really transparent about the work that I'm doing right now um, as, a, as it is a work in progress. All right, Woo. so let me start here. So um, the cultural objects that I'm most interested in studying are daguerreotypes. So uh, if you don't know what a daguerreotype is, this is, these are daguerreotypes. I'm a 19th century Americanist, but I think most of you are 20th century or the present. Do I have any other like ancient history fans? <laughs> Woo, all right, it's so like four of us. All right, great. Um, daguerreotypy was the uh, initial form of photography that was introduced into the United States uh, in 1839, November 11th, 1839. As you may know, photography has 23 different origin stories. Photography was invented in many countries at many times. It was kind of just a cultural moment where everybody's like, we have to be able to capture this on paper. Um, and in 1839, uh, Louis Manda Daguerre uh, released He's the guy in the top left with the cravat and the hair. You see it? Not that guy with the hair. I don't know who that is. He's awesome. But this guy up here, and this is the photograph that his predecessor made that he stole. This is a Nietzsche photograph. The one next to it is the first photograph made in Paris by this, by this type of photography. Now, daguerreotypes um, were uh, made free of charge uh, to every country except England by the French government. Um, and <laughs> that was personal. Um, the British had their own form of photography that was a positive negative process on paper by um, Talbot that actually turned out to be closer to what we use uh, in the 20th century. But in the 19th century, the daguerreotype became the preeminent and most expensive and finest form of portraiture that you could produce in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Um, up until about 1856, 1857. Something that you learn about photography if you start to study it is that it changes every 10 years. The technology completely shifts all of the, 
the things that we use to understand it, the theorizations, are completely different from generation to generation. And you know this from your own lifetimes, potentially, right? Um, I know that I have used at least four kinds of photography in my lifetime. Um, and then on top of that, we are always developing new ways of searching photos, sharing photos, etc. So photography is a really fascinating field that you must ground yourself in the technology that you're working with at the moment. So these are daguerreotypes. So my cultural objects have almost always been daguerreotypes and that is true since my BA thesis, y'all. My BA thesis was on daguerreotypes. Um, I got a daguerreotype on my wedding night as a gift from my husband. This is for real a major obsession. All right, we can talk about daguerreotypes all day long. All right, so um, I also want to talk to you a little bit about my approach. So this is the methodology that I use. And I've used this methodology for about eight or nine years now since I was first introduced to it um, in, uh, in uh, the, the early 2000s, uh, 10s. So micro-narrative is a methodology for addressing the gaps in historical narratives, and it is a form of recovery that follows the vectors presented by a single moment in time or text when all else may be archivally lost. Um, so I want you to think about, like, I've put a picture behind of the Japanese method of uh, mending with little tiny stitches, and that's a good way to think about it. A lot of things in the archive are missing because archives are built by hegemonic systems and institutions, right? And we decide what we want to keep and we decide what we don't really care about, right? And so we stitch these things together to try and make a narrative. And those little tiny stitches, these vectors are the things that come out of these, uh, these little documents. So for my first book, for example, all I had to go on was a three inch clipping from a newspaper from the Boston Telegraph from 1854. That's it, right? And in it, it had the name, her name is Mary, and it was by Charles Sumner, and it was about a daguerreotype. And, uh, and, and from there, the whole thing led a 13, uh, 13 year journey to find out more about this Mary. Now, micro-narrative has a little bit of a back history in several disciplines, so I'm just gonna go through that really quickly. Um, it's obviously related to literary close reading, which is a uh, process from the 1950s that has been in some ways debunked by Derrida and others, but it is it, it's still a practice that many literary historians use to dig in deeper to a text. For example, whole books have been written about the three words, call me Ishmael, all right? So that's close reading, thinking about very, very tiny bits of text and blowing them up and seeing what's behind the poetics convention and form that gives those three or four words meaning. Um, it also comes from social history work of the 18, 1980s and 90s, um, in which we are looking at archival sources that maybe are like prison records or so forth, uh, that looks at a wide range of a part of society that had not yet been discovered or discussed in historical spaces. Um, it comes from the projects of feminist recovery, which began in the 1970s and really picked up steam by the early 80s. The idea of feminist recovery has now moved to different groups of people, including we're recovering narratives by queer authors, we're recovering diaries and republishing them, um, we're making sure that native voices are in the Norton anthology, right? This is work that needed to be done and it starts in the feminist movement by republishing books that had been in the 19th century very popular, some of them way outselling our friend Melville here, but uh, who sold 60,000 copies of all of his books together. Um, so people are selling hundreds of thousands of copies of their book, but they've been forgotten. Those texts uh, are being brought back into print from the 1970s to the present. And last but not least, um, it is a project, micro-narrative is a sub-project of narratology, right? And so narratology is the study of the telling understanding how stories are structured, how they are structured together and strung together. And an understanding of narratology is a really key methodology for this kind of research because it helps you to tie one knot to the next knot and to make those stitches. Um, it's related to something called microspatial narrative, which sounds really sciencey, but really all it means is studying really, really deep on one specific place. Right? So if we were to say, for example, spend the next 10 years doing all of the research on this building 
and all the things in ha that have happened here. Um, photographic research, because it is a single moment, it's always a single moment, is a, a really great site for micro-narrative because we always start with something very small, a fraction of a second, right? Not even a full second, just like a 60th of a second is how long it took for a daguerreotype to be made. And that 60th of a second is the moment that we're gonna be spending the rest of this hour talking about, which is kind of fascinating. There's so many moments. We've already passed like, I don't know, almost an hour's worth of moments together. But this is the one moment from 1850 that we're gonna be discussing. All right, so let's move into the discussion of, uh, all right, whoop, 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 whoop. I have too many screens. Uh, in the mint show. All right, here we go, whoop. There we go, all right. So um, for about uh, this, this case, um, Tamara Lanier's case against Harvard University has been going on for 13 years. Um, she, 12 years um, ago, 13, 12 years ago, she walked into a uh, ice cream parlor in her hometown of Norwich, Connecticut, and um, talked to a friend there who owned the ice cream parlor, and he's an um, uh, amateur genealogist, and she expressed that she was concerned that her mother's oral histories would be lost when her, when her mom died, and it was so important to keep that family history alive because her mom had grown up in a home that included people who had been enslaved. And so if you think about that, that's uh, kind of striking that this woman here's mother who's pictured on the top right had people in her life um, growing up that had the experience of enslavement and had shared those experiences with her. And in particular had told a lot of stories about a Papa Renti, who was the patriarch of their family, who had come over from Africa, had taught himself to read, and had led their family through the emancipation uh, into the, the life that they lived in Connecticut. So Papa Renti was a key figure in their family, and many oral histories centered on him. And so she takes this story to Rich, Mr. Rich, who runs the ice cream shop. Mr. Rich has a fun hobby in genealogy. So he starts digging around on Ancestry.com and all that, and he finds the, the real like documentary evidence that backs up and aligns with all of this oral history. Unfortunately, he also finds, or fortunately, finds a bunch of daguerreotypes of her ancestors. Now, this is really, really rare in, um, in African-American history, uh, in particular, when black families are going into the archives to try and stitch together their micro-narrative, stitch together their family story, there's often very little there to work with. And then to, to, to yield a daguerreotype when there are so few photographs of enslaved people from the 1850s extant at all uh, is pretty extraordinary. Unfortunately, these daguerreotypes were of him naked. So if you can imagine what that impact would have been. You discover a picture, she locks eyes with her ancestor, she gets to see him, she recognizes the family resemblance, she's like, that is him, I feel it. And I know that feeling because I've spent a lot of time with daguerreotypes, they're actually mirrors, and you're looking at them, they're on mirrored plates, and you're looking at them and you're like, whoa, I'm really feeling this energy. Walt Whitman also talks about this, but we can talk about that on another day. All right, so she's spending time with these pictures, but unfortunately, they're very damaging. Right? The reason for that is that they were made to prove a theory called polygenesis. Now, um, that theory, I'm going to talk to you about it in a second, but before I get there, I want to, um, uh, I'm going to distribute this picture. So, something that I uh, really struggle with in this work is that she is very um, interested in understanding how to disseminate photographs of harm, photographs like this. Uh, that are really difficult to look at, and I don't want to make a slide of her uh, of her ancestors um, without clothes on. That would be offensive in every way. There was a publication by the Peabody Museum, which holds those daguerreotypes, called "To Make Their Own Way in the World." It came out in April of 2020, and this is that book. And you can flip through it and see the images for yourself. And, and I'm just going to pass that around. All right, so feel free. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so, um, let me see. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
So the photographs were made uh, to prove a theory that was being um, posited by uh, Louis Agassiz, who was a Harvard professor, not the only person who had this theory, but this was a theory that he was working with at the time. Um, I, I love this picture. This is so great. It's from 19, uh, this is from 1906. Um, uh, poly, uh, polygenesis. Uh, essentially is what it sounds like. It means many origins. It is a theory that was being um, worked on in the 1850s uh, to understand the origin stories of the different races. So the idea is that the Asiatic people, the Native Americans, the Africans, and the Caucasians all come from different origins, and that explains the differences in the races. It's one of those pseudoscientific uh, ways in which racism became biological. The idea was because race is not traced in any biological way, um, race is a, is a social construct, but they wanted to bed it into science in order to give it more kind of um, uh, social weight and credibility. And this is obviously going to be picked up by the pro-slavery folks who cottoned onto this right away. And Benjamin uh, Taylor, Benjamin Franklin Taylor, who owned the Taylor Plantation in South Carolina, through his um, scientific channels, had heard about this study and invited uh, Louis Agassiz to take photographs of the people that were there. Agassiz also commissioned photographs from uh, folks in Asia and, uh, in, and in Amazonians. Um, so we have all of these pictures were made in 1850 at the Columbia um, Plantation in South Carolina. Um, sorry, I have, a, I have a little bit of a cold, or I had a cold. Um, it's not COVID, um, but if I start, yeah. Um, so this photograph, uh, he made these photographs to prove the so pseudoscientific uh, idea. And um, the photographs are largely like an ethnological or anthropological study of these people's bodies um, so that you can get a sense of what those look like. This has obviously since been debunked. All right. So photography has been around for 183 years. Its products have been considered the property in that time of the photographer who then can publish, print, or display the image. And these products can then be seen by publics via curated and non-curated sources. In the 19th century, candid studio-based photography became the norm. Um, and then it was followed by the rise of print journalism in the 20th century and afterwards our familiar instantaneous global distribution of photographs in the 21st century. And this time, scarce legal and societal norms have developed around who and what we can see in photographic imagery. If you think about this, only social norms really exist. Like say, for example, uh, we moms don't photograph our ki other people's kids and post them on our Instagram because everybody has a different vibe about whether or not you should do that. That's a good example. But you know, those are just social norms. There aren't actually very many legal norms in place to protect subjects of photographs. There is a constituency, however, of globally recognized subjects who did not consent to notoriety or fame. The most famous of these is the migrant mother, uh, Florence Owen Jackson, who was photographed uh, by Dorothea Lang. Um, in recent years, subjects of these photographs, memes, and viral images have begun to resist objectification through the courts. Like a silent movie that has begun to speak, in the last few decades, the subjects of these images or their descendants are stepping forward and demanding reparations for the unpaid representational labor of being a face in the photograph. And uh, I'm calling these contested images because of the legal contest in which the subject's private narrative is in contest with the powerful public message that is made from the image. So if we talk about the ongoing case, Lanier v. Harvard, in March of 2019, Tamara Lanier or Tammy brought a case against Harvard University concerning the daguerreotypes of her ancestors, um, Papa Renti and Delia Taylor, Taylor, that were commissioned by Louis Agassiz. Um, these early photographs had been held and displayed by the Peabody Museum in Boston since 1977. Why 1977? Like, why the big gap in time? Those daguerreotypes were put by Agassiz into a drawer in his desk, and then the desk was moved into an attic, 
and they were rediscovered in 1977. So some, a researcher at the Peabody opened a drawer and found a, a cache of naked people from 19, 1850, which is kind of an amazing find, right? They are the oldest photographs that we have extant of enslaved people at this time. There's always new daguerreotypes coming out um, off eBay or whatever, but at this time. Um, Lanier contends that the subjects were, quote, stripped naked and forced to pose for the daguerreotype without consent, dignity, or compensation, end quote. Therefore, Harvard's use of these images for advertisement and commercial purposes constitutes, quote, wrongful seizure, possession, and expropriation of photographic images of the patriarch of her family. Um, the lawsuit that she has currently going demands just damages, reparations, and restitution of these historically insignificant daguerreotypes of Renty and Delia Taylor to Tamara Lanier. So this would uh, be a move from the public archive to private hands. The scholarly community, alongside Agassiz's descendants, have vocally stood with Lanier. So uh, Agassiz's descendants have been great about just getting right out in front of this and be like, she can have them, right? They don't belong to Harvard. They don't belong to anybody. They belong to her. These are her ancestors. Um, and uh, uh, the scholarly community has also come out in full voice, uh, m more or less, or obviously not everybody's in agreement, but uh, many, many uh, important scholars have come out in support of Lanier. This case was an, uh, initially dismissed in Massachusetts, um, and then she ran into Benjamin Crump, the civil rights lawyer who uh, recently um, was responsible for the trial of George Floyd, so you may have, you'll recognize him. If you want to follow a great Twitter feed, Ben Crump, all right? Uh, he like, has his finger on the pulse of civil rights in America right now. Um, but he has uh, taken up the case. Uh, they had an accidental meeting and uh, he, she explained what was going on in Massachusetts and he took up the case and now has a, a group of people working on that case with her. Um, on Nove in November of last year, oral arguments began for the appeal at the Massachusetts Supreme Court. At issue in the courtroom right now is the question of property rights. Does the subject of a photograph have any rights which the court must respect when it comes to any photograph? Are there rights on possessory rights, sorry, are there limits on possessory rights, such as when the photograph was made under duress or in asymmetrical situations, such as the one of enslavement? As Justice Elbeth, uh, Elspeth Seifer pointed out in the proceedings, slavery was illegal in Massachusetts at the time that the daguerreotypes were made. And does that, so that does that make, so slavery is illegal and Agassiz sends a guy down to, Ma um, to South Carolina to get the pictures made, does that make them instrumental to a crime? Daguerreotypes are artifacts and unique objects. However, they are also photographs and thus reproducible. This aspect of the discussion in the courtroom centers on determining if the daguerreotypes in question are objects or photographs because differing sets of property law apply to each. Further, the images have been reproduced countless times in publications around the world, in artwork by Carrie Mae Weems, in the archive, which shows Daguerrean reproductions to visiting researchers and publishes books like the one that's circulating here. So you can see these pictures pretty much anywhere. So she gets the daguerreotype back. We don't lose the pictures. So I just want you to keep that in mind. When a photograph is used to sell an idea, the subject becomes appropriated as an object, a symbol, or the face of an idea the story or the news. Thus begins the context between the subject of a potentially useful public image and the private person whose face has become the syntax upon which a message can be conveyed. As Ariella Azile remarks in her landmark text, which is about the photographic spectator, the civil contract of photography from 2008, Disenfranchised populations are more prone to turn into photographs, right? They're more prone to be used as messages than to become the photographers themselves. Often the public story that the image tells is so self-evident and the call to cultural memorialization is so compelling that this overwhelms any resistance the subject might feel to being objectified in this way. So we need that picture of the Syrian boy on the beach, regardless of how he might feel about it. 
Um, even so, as Azale argues, these subjects can take part in a power play on which they leave their photographed mark, even if they remain excluded from the hegemonic political game in which they are pawns. The part that these subjects can play is through the gaze, which demands the spectators consider the subject as participant citizens, as real persons, as enfranchised persons, and members of the body public. So by having photographs of people who look like our kids, for example, we see that and we recognize that the people experiencing what they're experiencing as refugees are in fact the same as us, right? So it allows us to have that tie. Um, in an interview last summer, um, sorry, last April, uh, Tamara Lanier, I'm just gonna let her use her own words, kind of said how she's seeing this situation. So this is gonna be, this is uh, Tamara Lanier who was interviewed by Hyperallergic uh, last April. It hurt for Delia for that reason. And I always felt like her exploitation and the other young woman who, you know, it was far worse than the men because of their young tender age and what they were forced to do. And again, about the destruction of the black family and the breaking down of relationships. And so I think about re-victimization when the image is shown but there's also a part of me that believes that if you don't see the extent of the harm you can't measure or have an understanding for the level of healing that is needed or the need for healing is needed and, and I say that, you know, I, when we've had these conversations with other reporters, I talk about Emmett Till, and I often say that I firmly believe that if Emmett Till had had a closed casket, the world would never know his name today. And I, you know, I know how much for that mother looking at her child in his condition in that casket, but she rose above that and wanted the world to know how much she was hurting and the only way to know that is to see his face and, and, and I also you know I, I'm a retired probation officer I worked in the courts I've written pre-sentence investigations where you have to make a recommendation based on what the evidence in the crime is and you have to look at crime scene photos in order to make that kind of assessment just as jurors have to view the ugliness of what happened in order to render a proper decision. So I it's it's I struggle with it because, you know, if you would ask Delia, she would say, I'd want clothes on. If you would ask some of the enslaved men, they would say, I don't want to be viewed that way. And um, but I think that to understand the impact of slavery and, and the inhumanity of it, I think rises above that to where it forces us to have the discussion and forces us to look at that. That's pretty powerful, right? As, um, yeah. Um, she's, um, she kind of brings up a couple of the research questions that I want to think about. And everybody's familiar with the Emmett Till photograph, yes? Yeah, okay. It's kind of amazing, right? We're sitting here in Middleburg and everybody's like, yeah, I know that picture. Yeah. Um, and that photograph is a little different in part because the mother of Emmett Till requested a photographer from a black publication to come and document her son's body. And in that way, it is she's both controlling the means of production, she is the photographer, and she's determining the narrative by which this story is being told. In which case the private narrative of her grief and the public narrative of the need for civil rights and the need to end lynching in the South coalesce into one narrative. This is different, right? In this situation, pa Louis Agassiz wants to say that Papa Renti is inferior, that he's a racial other, and that he's a radically racial other. And so that's why this photograph exists. But Tamara Lanier has a different private narrative that's completely at odds with that narrative. Her narrative is that this is our ancestor and that he was a brave and capable person and that he deserved better. And so it's a private versus public story. All right. Um, all right. So I've been, this is for the students. I put my research questions up. You're welcome. 
This is what I've been thinking about lately. You know, fun stuff, fun stuff. Um, when I visited the Peabody Museum, you know, it was kind of, I was like, should I go? I don't know, should I go? And I was in, I had to be at Harvard for another thing. And I was giving a talk there. And so I just booked a, I booked an appointment uh, at the Peabody to see these daguerreotypes. You have to request, you have to request to see them now. And you don't get to see the originals, you can see a daguerreotype reproduction. And um, the archivist brought out these exact replicas of the daguerreotypes three at a time. Uh, there are nine subjects in total, and each are photographed full frontally, all the way across the back and to the side. The women are from the waist up naked. So it's a really intense experience. And I asked her, like, what's the general response? Like, how do people handle this? And it's in a tiny dark room that's like surrounded by file cabinets. It's like feels very, uh, very odd. And uh, she said, yeah, people tend to have emotional reactions. And she pointed to the Kleenex box. I was like, okay, yeah. So it, uh, Harvard knows how impactful these photographs are. And um, in its case, in its, in its arguments, uh, in the most recent, in, on November 1st and 2nd uh, in, at the Massachusetts Supreme Court, Harvard argued, uh, the representative, obviously, the lawyer for Harvard, Harvard not being a, a human being, but uh, the lawyer for Harvard argued um, that he wanted to call attention to what it calls a disincentive for museums and archives to display images that it feels that the public needs to see. So they're saying we don't want to bury pictures of racism. We feel that they that we don't want to disincentivize people from showing difficult to see images because, um, for example, he gave the examples of photographs from the Holocaust or from Abu Ghraib. We don't want to bury those pictures. This angle of argument gestures at one of the outstanding problems in the ethics of photography in general, namely, what right does the public have to witness the pain and suffering of others? And when do the rights of the audience, both the once and future publics, us, people back in the 1850s, people in the 2030s, um, what, how do their rights outweigh the privacy of the subjects themselves, right? So the, the rights of Tamara Lanier versus the rights of these infinite publics. Um, also, what special pedantic function do photographs have to teach the publics about the past atrocities of history? And to what length should we go to protect this function? Marion Hirsch wrote in her amicus brief uh, in the case of Lanier v. Harvard that the photographs from the Holocaust are held in museums that represent the Jewish experience and not in institutions, as is the case of Harvard, that were historically complicit in the crime. Lanier could determine what context these images are shown, as owners of artworks and photographs in private collections always do, right? We have lots of daguerreotypes in private collections that are seen. Should this case be successful and should Harvard free rentee, preservationists and institutions that hold artifacts of historical significance in the United States could be made to give up treasured artifacts to private claimants. To return these photographs with damages would impact artistic and historical research in profound ways. If we can consider photographic images or image rights as objects, not as photographs, but as objects that can be repatriated and restored to their subjects, this will offer institutions that have housed, displayed, and disseminated racist imagery an opportunity to privilege the rights of the subject in a radically anti-racist move. This transfers the logic and methodology of repatriation, which we're using in colonial artifacts, to photography to regain that moral ground, where before there has been only complicity. If the archive releases its images of Renty Taylor, for example, we could see Tammy Lanier achieve reparations for the unpaid representational labor of an enslaved ancestor. I don't need to tell you how huge that would be. As museums today empty of their colonial spoils and repatriation, so too would our perception of what images uh, an audience has a right to see. We, I think, as historians and studies uh, Americanists, we need to relearn how we look at public uh, images and keep the private concerns in mind. So our own work as researchers is to continue to promote in our own minds what are the private concerns of the subject in this image? Um, when we witness these atrocities and asymmetries that photography has captured, 
The potential of this new way of looking and its risk lies at how seamlessly this concept of repatriation and uh, reparation can move from object to image. So um, I want to think about stitching together a kind of truer picture of the past that has that confluence that she, she, she wishes for when she refers to the Emmett Tell photograph. Um, as I've said, often the public story that the image tells is so self-evident and the call to cultural memorialization is so compelling that this overwhelms any private rights that the subject may have, including rights to property or privacy. My hypothesis as I move forward in this work is presupposing that while images are static, how we regard those past moments changes over time. How Agassiz and his contemporaries regarded Papa Renti and his photograph is radically different than how Agassiz's descendants or Papa Renti's descendants look at that photograph today and probably different than how you look at that photograph. Um, my previous work as a researcher, as I said, is photographed, uh, focused on photographs from the anti-slavery movement in the United States um, and, my, uh, and the phenomenon of the poster child, which emerged from that uh, hotbed of reform writing. My recent book, Girl in Black and White, uh, was a study around an unknown girl in a daguerreotype. And in that work, I demonstrated how a fictionally, politically motivated message about her race superseded and totally erased the inspiring biographical story of the actual child in the frame. Mary Mildred Williams, whose daguerreotype image was used as a poster child for American anti-slavery by Senator Charles Sumner, who ordered the photograph and captioned it with a fictional backstory of kidnapping uh, in order to make a message about we should be fearing that, that people are gonna kidnap our kids and sell them into slavery because she presents as white. She uh, was not white in, by the rubric of the time. In her adulthood, Mary Williams changed her name and distanced herself from her childhood fame to pass as white <laughs> and to live as queer in a segregated, closeted society. Due to these multiple layers of indiscretion, researching her story took me 13 years and 1,855 discrete artifact stitches from the archive to, to put it back together. She, I would argue, is America's first poster child, and she's the first to be the subject of propaganda, but I've also come to see her more recently as the first to resist becoming propaganda, to be contesting this story. And she would not be the last. The influence and centrality of photography to ideological messaging cannot be overestimated because photography is political. In its transmission from photographers to their patrons and public, the, the subject loses all rights to self-determination. Their subjectivity is subsumed into the message transmitted and no longer do we get to decide where we're showing our face, right? You don't get to save face. I remember this, I always think about this one poor guy. There is this really fabulous restaurant in New Orleans, it was around the corner from my old apartment, and it was uh, Turkey and the Wolf. It was very hip at the time. He's like, on, that guy's on Iron Chef and everywhere, and there's tons of pictures of this place. And in the pictures of the place and in the restaurant itself, there's a counter of embarrassing pictures from yearbooks that they've cut out and pasted as a form of art, really. They've laminated to the counter. And I just would look, I would go to buy my sandwich, because you know, I also went to this place because it was pretty great. Um, and I would go there and I would buy my sandwich and I would just feel so bad for those people in those pictures, right? With the awkward haircuts, the guy with the blue mohawk, all of the acne and the braces and all the things that yearbooks capture, right? They're not our best moments often. And so these pictures are now disseminated around the world. As Turkey and the Wolf becomes more famous, these poor kids are everywhere. And we all leave versions of ourselves behind as we grow and age and change. Um, but the photograph refuses to move on. And through struggle and revolution, liberation and decolonization can happen. But in our photographic record, the overthrown power dynamic is forever maintained. It's even featured. In the case of Mary Williams, her photograph persisted in the public well after her parents had removed her from the public eye. As her image testified, she was the last of four generations of women to suffer sexual enslavement, but the photograph persisted well past emancipation. 
Being identified in the photograph as a formerly enslaved black woman would mean that she lost her career, her apartment, and the livelihood, and potentially the partner that she maintained as a white woman. So if you think about that, she has to make sure that nobody knows this is her, and yet the pictures just keep circulating. Harvard professor Louis Agassiz, who actually lived really close to Mary, they like lived like three blocks away. I find, I find Boston so fascinating for this. It's just all mixed up together. Um, but uh, he sought to prove his theory of polygenesis and racial inferiority with the image of Papa Renty and Delia Taylor. And as such, looking at them solicits that same phenotypical gaze uh, that we are potentially bestowing on Mary Williams' photograph, looking at it to see if we can determine what her race is. Uh, my student, Sarah Washington, uh, last year, in the spring of 2021, I taught a class on photography, and she said she was mad. She was real mad. She's like, we only see the oppressed in the frame and never the oppressor. She's like, where are the full frontal nudes of Louis Agassi? That's what I want to see. And, the, and she's like, I don't understand why I don't just like walk in the Peabody and see any naked white men. And it was kind of interesting because when I, I actually, I, for this talk, I Googled image searched to see if there were any naked white men out there in the, in the ether. And I couldn't find any except for a couple of wrestlers with their shirts off. No Louis Agassiz. Uh, I found a really great picture of Louis Agassiz. But, um, and I think that the fact that we think this is funny and the absurdity of coming across a nude photograph of Louis Agassiz at the Peabody Museum um, next to the building that bears his name uh, aptly demonstrates the asymmetrical social power that he enjoyed and still enjoys. And the dignity that Renty Taylor was denied in 1850 when stripped and photographed and is still denied. So thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate and I welcome any questions. <laughs>